Uh, could you talk a bit about why? Why why did they get away with it? Yeah. Okay, so the first point I'd like to make is that obviously Israel's not alone in its ability to breach international law with the impunity. Um, the British government does the same thing, the US government does the same thing. So part of the answer is related to international power structures and the allies of the people who, uh, the allies of the powerful, effectively, are able to, are able to do that. Uh, Russia and Chechnya, etc. etc. et cetera. So part, that's part, a big part of the, uh, the answer. Obviously, there's also a reason that's more specific to Israel in terms of why, uh, until now, an alliance with Israel is seen as, uh, uh, as, a, seen as a, a beneficial option or seen as a good option to take by particularly, of course, um, successive US governments. And the reasons for that are um, several. Um, imperial, in terms of US geopolitical policy within a key region, having a strong, uh, highly militarized ally in that region is, um, has been useful. Uh, economic, as well, um, which is a bit different in terms of the business ties, the links between the industrial military complexes, etc., have also been very important. Um, Israel's export of weapons, etc., development, uh, and also the role of political pressure groups within within the US in question in this case, uh, in terms of uh, you know lobbying senators and congressmen, etc. So that's another way of kind of I guess looking at the uh, at the same um, at the same question, um, but I think those two things together are, are kind of the main main way of answering mm. answering that question. I mean, I mean, you could, yeah, there's loads of ways. You could throw in another example too, of course, which is you could look at impunity in a quite wide way and see how, until very recently, uh, Israel, the majority of Israel's neighbours and the majority of uh, Arab regimes in the Middle East have been some sort of co-opted dictatorship or autocracy, etc. So, I mean, there's been a lot of reasons why Israel, till now, has enjoyed that sort of uh, protection. I was just wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit more about solutions in terms yeah. of the one state uh, proposal that you made towards yeah. the end and um, how that can be achieved, perhaps maybe touching upon you know, BDS and things like that. Yeah. Uh, well, to kind of answer the question in reverse, um, the call for BDS by Palestinians doesn't mention any kind of political formula, which is very important. They, they mention three elements of that represent the rights of the Palestinian people in their entirety, which is uh, uh, the right of the Palestinian refugees to return, the end to discrimination and equality for Palestinians in Fortier area, and the end to military rule for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Now those three elements of the Palestinian call for BDS, the demands, are all consistent with um, human rights, international law, and don't in and of themselves suggest some kind of state structure of what, zero, one, two, three, four. Um, what, um, let's say, someone might come back, kind of respond to that and say, all right, but if you had the right of return for Palestinian refugees, then you would have a large number of Palestinians inside, um, what, is, um, inside what is now Israel, and Israel would cease to be a Jewish state from the point of view of not having a Jewish majority. And so either it would be you know, enforcing, uh, uh, you know, non-voting rights on the non-Jewish population, etc. So people will see the BDS call as being related to, the, to uh, Israel ceasing to be, a, to be a Jewish state with regards to all the ways in which it discriminates against non-Jews. Um, going back to the first part, um, I'm personally someone who thinks that a, a single, one democratic state is uh, the, the both the most realistic, actually, formula and also the best way for Palestinians to realise their basic rights uh, and a solution that goes to the very heart and addresses the question at the very heart of the whole, uh, of the whole, of the whole issue in the first place. Um, and it requires a kind of process of decolonisation that will touch upon a lot of, a lot of areas, okay? And uh, most of the work on this has yet to be done. People are starting to do it now because for such a long time the two-state discourse and framework and formula was what's dominated the international peace process, also uh, the PLO's platform, etc. 
uh, and a lot of solidarity activists' work too over the decades. Um, so a lot of energy hasn't been yet fully invested, it took nearly fully invested, in working out practicalities of decolonization and, uh, and what a one state looks like. But look, it would touch on issues to do with land distribution, allocation of resources, education, you know, uh, obviously like the parliamentary system, etc. Uh, and some people consider a version of the single state uh, by nationalism, which can be look a bit different, maybe, to um, a simple one state where one person has one vote. And they look at a few different examples around the world where you've got kind of two ethnic groups who have a formula for sharing power within the same uh, state. That work is now increasing, as I've mentioned, and I think that's only going to get more uh, people. I think that's only that noise is only going to get louder. And what you see happen, which is quite interesting, is that people who would, I guess, identify themselves um, both as liberal Zionists and also people who are maybe uh, religious Jews too inside um, Palestine Israel from different points from start from different starting points are starting to um, give answers to this whole question of okay if a two-state solution is dead what happens next um, and how that conversation is going is, is quite interesting to follow and it's much nearer the much much nearer the starting point than it is the end and from the Palestinian point of view, uh, the starting point and how the conversation is going so far doesn't go anywhere near meeting basic rights of equality, etc., etc. But it is an interesting process. Okay, from the religious Jewish perspective that I mentioned, you find the voices who are saying that it's more important to be in physically present in the land without Jewish sovereignty as a state in state terms, and from uh, from, from let's, the more kind of liberal Zionist position, you start to see um, discussions about what binationalism would mean, okay, and whether it really would be the sort of horrible nightmare that so far people have tried to kind of uh, describe it as. Um, so it's always dangerous to make predictions about, uh, about this, but a prediction I'm reasonably confident <coughs> making is that uh, the pronouncements of the death of the two state solution, which is sort of like something that happens all the time, will continue and more, I mean I'm not talking about next month, but I'm talking about the process probably of uh, you know, months and years, more and more groups uh, will start talking about what needing to think beyond the two-state paradigm uh, and Palestinians and Palestinian Soviet activists will have to be thinking about how best to be uh, advancing Palestinian rights in the context of that conversation taking place, of the what next conversation taking place. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, what do you think about the UNP? Do you think it's going to make a change? Is it a positive change? Does it not really matter? Uh, well, I was and remain, like on the whole, very skeptical about the, uh, the UN bid for different reasons, including the lack of legitimacy of the people making the decision to go to the UN, lack of legitimacy in terms of representation, uh, lack of democratic, transparent representation of all the Palestinian people, of course including the refugees, for a decision that is, you know, whether or not it means something, at least on paper it's, it's still a significant thing, but there is, there is uh, there's a lack of uh, reformed democratic representative structure in the context of the PMO, that for me, makes it problematic that sort of uh, that sort of development. Um, I mean, okay, the PA is not even really representative within the area it's meant to be controlling. Um, uh, another angle you can look at it from the point of view of well, okay, you go to the UN, uh, you, you secure uh, you secure your um, uh, your status there, but what do you do then? Because in theory, you can only, it's only useful if you then use it in the context of other strategies. And again, I see, until now, a lack of an ability or desire of Abbas and the people around him to be using that statehood with other strategies that would make it more meaningful. Right? Uh, you've got to ask yourself, is a group of Palestinian leaders who for decades 
have followed a course of action that's been based on the idea that you have positive relations with the US and to a lesser extent other global powers in order that they would influence Israel, that you conduct negotiations with your occupier, that you uh, uh, conduct joint security and military uh, operations with, with the occupiers, are they likely to take that UN status and say, go to the ICC with it? Is that going to happen? Now, they talk about it, okay? But again, I would be skeptical about to what extent that would be used in, in, a, in a way that would genuinely be challenging and advancing uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, rights in that case. Uh, and yeah, beyond that, you can say, well, also, it can't be, it's not enforced. I mean, again, without, without mechanisms of enforcement, again, it is also just a, a, you know, like a kind of moral victory, perhaps. Um, yeah, that was a question, wasn't it? I was just thinking about it, it was like a part two. But, uh, so yeah, so I'd be overall skeptical. And in some of those cases, in some, in some of the things I've just spoken about, it could be a case of being happy to be proved wrong, right, as, as time passes. But I would, I would just suggest that at the moment I don't see any reason or signs for now why that would be proved wrong. Um, you mentioned area C. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming there's an A and B. Yeah. What would those areas be? Like? Yeah, I'm so sure. area A, B and C, there is no D, it's just A, B and C. <laughs> and that is referring to um, the, the theory of the Oslo Accords on paper and as it was presented to the public, was that you'd be, to, especially to the Palestinian public, is that uh, incremental measures of increasing autonomy for the Palestinian Authority would eventually arrive at such a point whereby there is a, a statehood, real, a real on the ground state. And as part of the idea of incremental autonomy, area A, the smallest area, is in theory full 